venerable religious and dear parishioners, it's not yet the feast of St. Michael, the Archangel, nor that of the Holy Angels on October 2nd, but I would like to speak about the angels today to help us prepare for our patronal feast this Saturday. So when we look at the teaching of the church regarding the angels, we see that God has given to each and every one of us a guardian angel who accompanies us every second of our lives until we die. That's both a very consoling thought but also a sobering thought. Why is it consoling? Because isn't it wonderful to know that we are never alone, that we also that we always have this very, very powerful being with us, totally spiritual, that's why we can't see, hear, or, or perceive with our senses, our angel, always there to help us, always trying to help us or inspire us in some way. And that is so wonderful. But the sobering aspect is our angel is also a witness to every single action, every single deed we do. Both our good deeds and every single sinful action that is ever committed. And we think of the recording angel, how our angel has a book, so to speak, a spiritual book, writes down all these things. Of course, God knows everything, but nevertheless, it is so true that our angel is a witness to everything happening in our lives. When do we get our guardian angel? It's a pious belief that it happens the day of our birth. That's why sometimes one's birthday is called one's angel day. I don't know that this is official church teaching. It seems like perhaps the angel, guardian angel of the mother watches over the mother and her unborn child until the day of birth comes. But uh, I'm not 100% sure of that, but certainly nothing wrong with thinking of it uh, of the of our birthday being angel day what is an angel an angel is a totally spiritual being and in this way angels are more like god than we are because we have a soul and a body and our soul is that spiritual part of us that is like god but we also have a body. Angels have no body, but that makes them even more powerful. And God endowed them with great power, wisdom, and holiness when he created them. They transcend our powers by far. Angels because they are not confined to a body, can be in more than one place at a time. Although, obviously, they're not everywhere. Only God is present everywhere. They move with the, with the speed of thought. Your angel right now is right with you at, at Mass. If only we could see how reverent, adoring, and prayerful our angel is. We can't, but we have to believe that. And truly, when we receive Holy Communion, our angel then turns to us and adores our Lord physically within us. And if angels could be envious, they would be jealous that we can receive Holy Communion and never once can they because they don't have a body. You have to have a human body to receive the body, bl blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. Also, one example of the power of an angel, we read in the Old Testament how one time there was a camp of 
near 200,000 uh, Assyrian soldiers ready to attack God's people, the Israelites. And God sent one angel, and in that one night, that angel killed the whole army. That's the power of one angel. God could have done it himself, but he sent the angel to do it. God sends angels as messengers. That's what the word angel means. Angelus, messenger. Again, God doesn't need angels, but he very fittingly created them, and he gives them as a duty to take messages from him to us and from us to him. And then the we see in scripture the angel Gabriel appearing to Our Lady. He was the messenger for the greatest announcement the world would ever hear, that God would become man, that God is becoming man. So we get an idea then of what the angels are, and they must have been created before the human race because There was already a devil tempting Eve in the form of a a serpent when God created our first parents. So God created the angels first, but he did not let them see the beatific vision right away. They had to earn it. Like anyone else with a free will, you have to deserve it. You have to make the right choices. You have to merit it. So God put the angels to a test, all of them. And I think there are hundreds of billions, if not more than that, angels. So God put them to a test. We don't know what that test was. And the thinking among Bible scholars is that about a third of them rebelled against God because in the apocalypse, right before St. John talks about the battle between the good angels and the bad angels, it says the dragon dragged his tail through the heavens, bringing down a third of the stars. So that's one interpretation that about a third of the angels fell. We rebelled against God. They didn't pass the test. It was not a, well, since they're pure spirits, they could only be tested insofar as humility and obedience was concerned. And what was the test? Maybe that they would have to adore the incarnate God one day, or they would have to submit to Mary as queen of the angels. And the pride of a third of the angels would not let them say yes to God. The creatures rebelled against their creator. And as scripture tells us, and this is in the apocalypse, I believe it's right around chapter 11 or 12, God then commissioned St. Michael, our patron, to lead the heavenly host of good angels against the bad angels. And it says there was a tremendous battle. I would have to say it was greater than any battle that could happen here on earth because these are this is angelic warfare. These are angelic beings literally fighting it out. How that exactly happened spiritually, we don't know, but a great battle happened in heaven. And why did God commission Michael? Because his name, Mikael, from, taken from the Hebrew, means who is like unto God. And we see his motto right there to the left of his image in the stained glass window, quis ut deus, means, it means who is is like unto God. Nobody. But when Lucifer, Satan, and all the bad angels were rebelling, they were saying, we don't want to submit to God. But submit the creature must. So from that moment on, making their decision for all eternity, 
You see, angels only get one chance. Because of their superior intellect, they don't need all the chances that we experience in life. They made their choice, and the bad angels were cast into the fiery pits of hell. And God allows them to roam the earth, many of them. Again, we can't see them. And they are there to tempt human beings. They want human beings to be with them in hell. They did not lose their power or their knowledge when they fell. They did lose their holiness, their goodness, their moral goodness. They lost their love. And that's why hell is filled with hate. It's interesting, those two words, they both begin with H. It's a state of absolute lovelessness. And that is the way it will be for all eternity in hell. Those that choose to not love God, a, an eternity of hate awaits them in all their sufferings. So this is just a brief summation of the power of angels. But I would like to emphasize that we are blessed that we have that leader of the angels as our special patron. And God in his providence calls people. He, he creates them, so to speak, for a certain parish. It's not just accident, pure accident that you're here or I'm here. We have to remember God's providence disposes things. And from all eternity, God knew that this building on a hill north of Spokane, meant to be a Jesuit seminary, would one day be our spiritual home under the patronage of St. Michael. And as, I, as we put in the bulletin, it goes way back, the, the original two missionaries to this area, Father Adrian Hecken and Peter DeVos, they established the first mission here. Actually, it was up by Newport, Washington, but the floods, the spring floods would, would wash away the mission. Not a good place to have a mission if it's going to be flooded every spring. So they moved it to here, and just over here on Palmer Road, was where the, 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 the site of St. Michael's mission was, and it was the headquarters for Jesuit activity in this whole area under the leadership of Father Joseph Cataldo. So God destined him as our patron, and I believe that every parish should have a particular devotion to its patron. So if somebody goes uh, to Mass at St. Teresa Parish, they should have a special devotion to St. Teresa. Or if they were in St. Peter and Paul Parish, they should have a special devotion to St. Peter and Paul. Or to Blessed Sacrament Parish, they should have a special devotion there. All of you are called to a particular devotion to St. Michael the Archangel. Because God in his providence has destined him to be our patron. And in this day of increased difficulty and the triumph of the forces of evil and more spiritual warfare, very likely persecution on the horizon, we are blessed to have the leader of all of the heavenly host as our patron watching over us. But we will profit from his protection, his patronage, only by having that special devotion to him. This is what you need to work on. Be devoted to St. Michael. Often invoke him. Learn more about him. Read about him. There's private revelation about St. Michael. And 
it will only help you in your devotion. St. Louis Reed of Montfort, I was just that thought just occurred to me. He says St. Michael glories in the fact that whenever our whenever our lady asks him to do a special mission, the, all the angels love and submit to Mary, their queen. And he will go, most gladly go and fulfill anything that she wants him to do. One last point, and this again shows the providence of God. That in the late 80s, we were able to rescue from demolition the altars and statues from an orphanage in Superior, Wisconsin. And the name of the chapel where these where these orphans were living and where they would often go to Mass and pray was a chapel of the angels. And when we first rescued them, I mean, the idea was we don't know where they're going to go. And that was in 1988. It took three semi-truck loads to bring it all the way from Superior, Wisconsin to Spokane. And they sat in crates for couple of years or more, and the thinking was it w- they would go into Mount St. Joseph. But then the decision was made, put them in here, and it has been an absolutely perfect fit. I mean, just look at the, al- the main altar, look at the two side altars. They perfectly fit. All of the angel statues, and there's close to a hundred uh, angel images, statues or images in this chapel. And isn't that, doesn't that just show God's providence that he would have all these artifacts come and be in this chapel and, again, a perfect fit. Never forget, too, that the bishop who founded that orphanage, Bishop Augustine Schinner, was personally assigned by Pope St. Pius X to be the first bishop of Spokane. He came here in 1914, I believe, or 1913 or 1914. So many years later, this was in 1991, by the way, that we installed the altars, the statues. So it's like the his orphanage, uh, holy artifacts followed him over just years later. So again, God's providence. So my hope today is as we prepare for our patronal feast this Sunday, or rather Saturday, we will be more aware of the angels, more aware of what they do, more conscious of them witnessing everything we do throughout life, and also God's providence in giving St. Michael to be our patron and to have these beautiful sacred editions made here for the glory of God and for our spiritual help and welfare. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.